Okay, but by way of by way of introduction, let's start by thinking about the pharmaceutical industry. There was a major dearth of innovation in the pharmaceutical industry in the early 2000s because R&D failures were starting to, to rise. Costs of developing new pharmaceuticals was beginning to rise. And some had feared that peak pharma had, had really passed. But you know, fast forward now to 2020, and the pharmaceutical industry has really done a, a paradigm shift. Uh, and they've done that through the development of biologics. A lot of the top selling drugs right now in the pharmaceutical industry in red are protein biologicals rather than chemical synthetics. So the industry has really done a, a gone through a transformation in its innovation because those biologics are, are quicker to develop. They've got a much better safety profile and there's fewer failures in development. Biologics tend to be very large molecules compared to the, the synthetics. Aspirin, for instance, uh, maybe 20 atoms. Insulin has about 1,000 atoms. And then these larger, more protein biologicals have, like Humira, an antibody about 100,000 in, in size. Uh, but they're derived from natural sources. Their activity and functionality can be tuned by altering the code that makes up these, up these molecules. And so for that reason, they are able to, to uh, start to fill part of the innovation gap in that industry. So right now, uh, crop protection is primed in the same way. At least our company feels that way. We, we have been largely focused on small molecule synthetics since the 1980s. Discovery and development are conducted in-house by your major agrochemical companies because smaller companies really can't afford to get into the business. And it's having some of those same problems. So blockbuster chemicals are being pulled from the market for whatever reason. There is increasing regulatory scrutiny. So it's, so it's harder to push them through. Uh, greater development costs and longer timelines. Uh, and a, definitely a declining pace of successful product introductions. And that's the, the ag chemical industry as far as crop protection. So we are on the course right now to replicate essentially the paradigm shift that happened in the pharmaceutical industry. Here you see just a general idea of the decline in the release of novel active ingredients as far as pesticides go. And you can see the increasing costs in the development of pesticides, up to maybe $300 million it will take to, to release, do the development and the work to release a new insecticide active ingredient. Uh, so that brings us to where our company fits in and how we've taken advantage of that. We are still a relatively small company as far as employees go, uh, but that number will, will double or maybe triple in the next few years. We were incorporated back in 2005, largely as an R&D company to develop the concept of insecticidal peptides, um, prove commercial viability, maybe sell it off to another company and then start working on the next one in the chain. But we have since shifted entirely to going fully commercial uh, just as our own organization. We have uh, headquarters in the last three years in Durham, North Carolina. Our research site is in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And uh, some like myself and the sales team, we are working from remote offices in different geographic areas of the country. We are backed uh, very generously by leading ag tech uh, companies, which keep us afloat. And we've just recently received a series three funding, which will keep us afloat for the next three years or so. So we've had a very successful goal of it with our new board of directors and our new CEO. So we want to lead a peptide-based revolution in crop protection. Again, similar to what the pharmaceutical industry went, went through a, a decade or two ago. We want to give growers, farmers, novel and effective chemistries that address proven neuromuscular targets. Uh, and we want those peptides to overcome existing insecticide resistance challenges. And we want to offer the best possible safety profile as, as new generations of kinds of insecticides. Um, 
I'm gonna skip over this. So where where do we start? Our inspiration comes from and came from nature. Um, animal venoms just happen to be a very rich source of different kinds of uh, bioactive compounds, digestive enzymes, antimicrobial peptides, defense peptides, and then insect selective peptides. So when you fractionate, say, the, the venom of the funnel web spider, uh, all these different peats, all these different bioactive compounds, and in the literature, people have um, published on the different roles of those proteins and peptides in that venom. And our company has uh, looked at that and found insect, insect selective peptides that we might be able to develop and turn into a commercially viable uh, peptide. And our, our first one is called the Spear Bioinsecticide. It's active ingredient. Is meant to be written, never said, <laughs> it was right there. Uh, but our inspiration for the first one has come from the funnel web spider. Mm. Our second peptide will also happens to come from a, uh, a spider as well. And our third one, however, does not come from a, a spider at all. So we are no longer want to be considered the spider venom company, which is how the company made a big splash about 10 years ago. We want to be considered as the, the peptide company. So similar to the, ph the pharmaceutical industry, you've got those small synthetic molecules like a metacloprid, maybe 27 atoms. You've got the spear peptide, maybe a thousand atoms. And then you've got the protein biologicals such as cry one ac from, from BT, very large things. And, and what I'm gonna point out here because it will be relevant really pretty soon is this is a very, very large molecule compared to a metacloprid. It's about 20 times the size. Uh, then this is another magnitude shift, shift as well. But that size of the molecule does have some challenges for turning this into a, a um, commercially viable product. So the spear peptide, the first one in our pipeline, was derived from a naturally occurring bioactive venom constituent. Uh, for those of you who know your biochemistry better than I do, it's a specific inhibitor cysteine knot type of protein with three disulfide bridges. Those disulfide bridges are important for that structure to maintain its three-dimensional shape. So then when it hits its, its target site, that shape is what binds to that target site and gives us the uh, neurotoxic impact. Uh, there are 40 amino acids in that structure. There's the active ingredient uh, and about eight, 20 times larger than imidacloprid. Now, this 40 amino acid structure is now pretty highly derived from that original wild type chain of amino acids. There's a lot of reasons, and I'll explain that in a second, why we had to modify that chain of amino acids because we have to, to turn this into a product much different than what the spider originally uh, made it out to be. Well, what we do know is that unlike a lot of the biologicals, uh, Spear has extreme target site specificity. We know exactly where it's working. Some biologicals are something of a black box. We don't really know how they work entirely. They may have a feeding deterrent or an overposition deterrent or some of these other things. But just like your synthetic molecules, we don't know exactly where spear works, and that's the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor in the central nervous system of insects and mites. And it works specifically at site two in contrast to two other classes of, of modes of action, which also work on the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, and that would be the spinosins and the neonicotinoids. Because of the novelty of that site, it has been determined that there is no cross-reactivity or cross-resistance with these other chemistries, and so it was awarded a new uh, group 32 from the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee, indicating that uh, no cross resistance with, it, with uh, existing chemistries, and it would be a very good tool for insecticide resistance management, just as a way to uh, diminish our reliance on, on other chemicals and, and, and slow the development of insecticide resistance by incorporating a new hierarchy. What's interesting is you can see here part of the dearth of, indus of, of industry innovation outside the biological realm because the last neuromuscular group ever approved by IREC was back in 2007. So it took your chemical, your synthetic chemical industry 11 years, well, they, they don't have another one yet, more than 11 years 
to come up with something new. We now have SPEAR as a new IRAC group. Our second peptide in the pipeline will be approved by the EPA at the end of this year. And uh, it will very, very likely be yet another IRAC group. Our third pipeline peptide will be submitted to the EPA at the end of this year. And that will also likely be awarded a new IRAC group. So in the course of four or five years, a small startup company has released three new modes of action and it has taken a very long time for, for chemical approaches to be able to come up with that type of innovation. So I, I just challenge you all as you're thinking about pest management that uh, we've all got thoughts about what biologicals are or aren't, but really in, a lot, in developing innovation, a lot of that now is going to come from the biological world rather than the chemical synthetic world. These are the six main neuromuscular um, modes of action or target sites. Uh, in fact, 80% of the global insecticide industry is based on these six neuromuscular modes, modes of action. Steer functions against the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, right? Where the neonics and the spinosins are. Our second in our pipeline, 7300 will also work on the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, but at a distinct site and not have cross resistance. So, so we'll likely be awarded a new IRAC group. The third in our pipeline, 6700, will be effective against the sodium channel where the pyrethroids uh, and, and DT, DDT formally operate. And going forward, uh, Vesteron will be looking for a peptide alternative at this site and at this site and at this site and at this site as well as part of our development. So in, in, in essence, it's the opportunity to reset the resistance clock. We can still have something that has the impacts on the sodium channel, but as we lost DDT and as we're losing pyrethroids because of resistance development, we can turn to the peptide world to come up with another mode of action that might Okay, so, so SPEAR has target site specificity. It's also classified as a bioinsecticide by the US EPA, and it has all the best grower-based qualities that any insecticide could have. A zero-day pre-harvest interval means you could spray it this morning, pick it this afternoon, and be eating it this evening uh, because there are no residues. What does a, uh, a peptide break down into? Amino acids. There's no toxic metabolites involved. And so being able to eliminate a residue issue is a really valuable attribute for new, new insecticide. A lot of your other biopesticides also have this attribute. Uh, very safe for non-targets. Four hour restricted entry interval, that is you can spray it now and you can go back in without protective gear uh, four hours after that. So it's got all those great attributes. Now, is active via contact and active via ingestion. Let me start with the contact side of things because this is a little more straightforward. Uh, this was a, the first work that the, uh, the company uh, really embarked upon looking at greenhouse tests. To be active via contact or as a topical spray, we have to use very high concentration solution at high rates. The labeled rate for this product that goes via contact is one to three gallons of product per acre, for instance. Uh, and it relies on, once the product lands on the insect, it relies on diffusion of that spear and peptide through the spiracle into the hemolymph and thereby in, in contact with the uh, central nervous system. So the main targets that are, might be susceptible to a peptide like this are your smaller, softer body insects, like your, your thrips, your mites, your aphids, your white flies, your psyllids they would have the, the, the greatest susceptibility just because of their body size and their, their surface area. So that's via contact. Now, before I talk about via ingestion, I, I want to address the issue of bioavailability because this is where the size of that peptide comes into play. Um, so insects, to make it uh, available via ingestion, that peptide has to handle the gut environment, and then somehow that peptide has to make it into the hemocytes of the target site. 
So some of our major advances are based on being able to become those three aspects of, of bioavailability. One of those aspects is uh, stability under the proteases that are there in the insect gut. Those proteases will do rapid work on uh, degrading a, a peptide. And you can see here with a, a wild type amino acid sequence, uh, that rapid degradation in the titer of, of the peptide uh, over very little time. But with some changes in the amino acid primary sequence, you swap this for that, you change that around, you start to modify it from, from that uh, wild type back in the spider, right? Uh, you can make those mutations, and we have a, a team dedicated to making sure that we can change that, that stability and uh, reduce the level of stability so we can overcome the bioavailability challenge of all those proteases interacting with the peptide once the insect eats it. The other issue of bioavailability in the insect gut is, is pH. At the range of pHs that the insect gut occurs, we need to be modifying an amino acid sequence so that the mutation we're working on now can handle whatever pH stability is prevalent across those target species. The third aspect, third and final aspect of bioavailability uh, required a more creative um, study or, or, or approach. We needed to now that that peptide could handle the gut environment, how do you get this very large molecule through the paratrophic membrane in the gut wall into the, in the, the central nervous system? And this is where our current bioavailability work around for that uses Bt. At a sublethal, sublethal low rate of Bt, what happens? You get some disruption of that gut. You get holes in that gut. At high rates of Bt, right, it breaks down so much that the insect dies of septicemia because of two, you know, the hemolymph and the gut juices mix, mixing up. Uh, but at low rates, all we really need is enough of that gut disruption to allow the peptide to now diffuse successfully across that and into the, the nervous system. So our current workaround right now, uh, allowing that peptide to pass through the gut walls is to use a low label rate of a bacillus thuringiensis uh, product. And that question in question, when the molecular molecule size is bigger, does not it take, it's harder to get into the, uh, past the peritrophic membrane? That's right. So these molecules are bigger by a little more. Peptide Yeah, yeah, 20 times bigger than your, your. So that doesn't cause any problem in passing through the membrane? The That's size right. of the molecule? Okay. Yeah, and, you know, a metacloprid or some of these synthetics could probably just get through themselves. I don't know, know enough about the physiology, but with something that's 20 times larger, uh, it's very difficult to get it through. Now, we do have oral activity without BT against certain other specific insects that we're trying to study and understand it more. But when you're looking at lepidopterin pests, one of the most versatile alternatives as a facilitator for this BT, uh, facilitator for the spear is using that sublethal rate of uh, BT. Uh, so the BT does not need to kill the insect. It can use rates lower than that, but it needs to... Uh, allow the neurotoxin to get through and, and uh, cause the damages. When you take a look at this in the laboratory level and you're really able to manipulate things around is you can sort of express that with, with the idea of a synergy. You know, when Spear is used alone, you can work with an LC20 rate like this. When Dipel, which is BT per stocky product, uh, you can develop an LC20 like this, but when you apply them together, you get a much, much greater than additive response. And this is the interaction that this product concept, the insecticidal peptide concept, is exploiting to overcome this aspect of, of bioavailability. So we have a native amino acid structure, but we are far mm -hmm. removed from that native amino acid structure. We need to, I call them our amino acid engineers, I think they would have a different name for themselves, but there are gurus in, in the R&D group which know how to make that peptide handle the proteases, handle the pH, 
uh, uh, have higher toxicity and lower toxicity. And then also we need to be able to manipulate that, that amino acid chain so we have very good production under liquid fermentation. So how do we, how do we make it? The production concept is, is easy. You take the you take uh, uh, development of the peptide, you incorporate it into a genetically modified food grade yeast. That yeast under liquid fermentation secretes your peptide of choice. Uh, and if you do that efficiently enough and you can get 10 grams of active ingredient per, per liter of fermentation liquid, then now you have something that is actually commercially available. And all of those aspects is something that Vesteron was able to put together those aspects earlier on than, than the other uh, larger companies which have looked at the uh, peptides in the past. So secretes our peptide in liquid fermentation. We can concentrate that product as much as we can. We filter out the DNA, add a little preservative and we bottle it. It's got more than a two year shelf life doesn't have to be refrigerated, it can be kept under room conditions, so it has that versatility as most of your conventional insecticides as well. So this is what Vesseron has been able to put these pieces together. We can now produce it at scale at reasonable cost, and the system, the platform that we've developed is going to work for our second, our third, and the rest of our pipeline peptides because we know what needs to be tweaked so that we can get high titers in production levels. This regulatory pathway was no, no small feat either um, because there may be some question as to whether we're really a biological or a chemical, uh, or are we a microbial or a biochemical? We're certainly not a plant incorporated <laughs> pesticide. So what were we? And thankfully with, with regulatory, a, a new branch of uh, biologics group, uh, emerging technology, um, came to be to handle a biopesticide product like, like Spear. So we, we sort of think of ourselves as a, as a synthetic biological, but we are classified as, a, as biological. And now there is a firm regulatory path. So instead of taking the conventional chemistry path where product development is going to cost you $300 million, we can take the biological regulatory path where, where development costs maybe $30 million very big difference in being able to develop and bring to market new products. And then we've overcome that, the bioavailability <laughs> challenges, the stability and, and getting through into the insect government. So 